inoculate from the carpus. They are rare injuries, they are of a high energy, and they, whilst they can be purely ligamentous, they often have bony fracture components to them. I'm not going to spend a large amount of time talking about carpal instability today because that's a talk in itself, but perilunate injuries are an example of a complex carpal instability. One of the dangers with perilunate injuries is that you can have a pretty innocuous looking PA radiograph. So this is a PA radiograph of a patient with a perilunate injury. And it's only when we refer to the lateral radiograph that you can see that the capitate has dislocated relative to the lunate. And this is one of the reasons why understanding perilunate injuries is important. And that's because 25% of these potentially devastating injuries are missed at presentation. And there is good evidence to show that delayed treatment of these injuries worsens the outcome. So how can you stop yourself being the lady or gentleman that misses the injury? Well, Galula was a North American radiologist and he described three lines, three radiological markers that you can use to detect carpal instability. The first line is a curved line drawn along the proximal aspect of the proximal carpal row. The second line is also a curved unbroken line drawn over the distal aspect of the proximal carpal row. And the third and final line is a curved unbroken line drawn over the proximal aspect of the distal carpal row. And these are the Lula's lines. Now, if we go back to a PA radiograph, a normal PA radiograph and the injury radiograph I showed you before, you can see that the Lula's lines on the normal image on the left are beautiful, they're unbroken, they're curved. Whereas on the right, you can see that they're not continuous, they're broken, so this would give you an idea that there was something going on in the carpus. So how do we classify these injuries? Well, the famous classification is that from Mayfield. And Mayfield originally described a purely ligamentous injury. And he staged it from one to four. And when you progress from one to four, this is an indication of increasing energy of injury. He also described the mechanism of injury. When you fall onto a hyperextended wrist, the first movement that the wrist goes through is ulnar deviation. And this diagram is taken from his paper. And you can see the center of rotation of this ulnar deviation occurs around the uh, cross in the center of the capitate. The jagged lines are tissues that are not under tension and the straight and broken lines are those that are under tension. So you can see that from the initial ulnar deviation, this is how you injure the radial sided structures. The next motion that the carpus goes through is that of intercarpal supination. And this is centered around the uh, rod which is going through the triquetrum. And you can see that the carpus is now supinating relative to the lunate. And this is how you derive the more ulnar sided injuries. Johnson in the same year described the lesser and greater arc injury patterns. So the lesser arc depicted by the red line are purely ligament injuries. This is easy to remember, L for lesser arc, L for ligament. The greater arc injuries depicted by the blue line are bony or fracture components to the injury. And these are termed trans injuries. So if you have a trans scaphoid perilunate, it means that the fracture is in the scaphoid. You can have transradial, transscaphoid injuries, meaning that both the radius and the scaphoid is broken. In order to understand how best to assess and manage perilunate injuries, we need to understand a little bit about the ligaments within the wrist. There are two main types of ligaments in the wrist, intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments. We'll talk about the intrinsic ones first. So the origin and insertion of these ligaments is within the same row. So in the image, the yellow lines are the scaphalunate and lunotriquetral ligaments. And these are often injured in the context 
or a perilunate injury. The extrinsic can be divided into four. The straightforward way of thinking about the palmar extrinsic ligaments is to think of them like a citron car sign. They're two parallel chevrons. The proximal chevron, it consists of the long and short radial lunate ligaments and the ulnar lunate ligaments. The short radial lunate is important and we'll sort of come back to this in a moment. The uh, distal of the two chevrons can part, can yeah, the connect. Sorry for the interruption, but uh, it seems that you're away from internet signal. So if you could get closer to internet signal, because your voice is a bit interrupted, and um, if you're turning on okay. your video, uh, uh, it's better that you turn it off. So you use the internet mainly for the presentation. Okay, my. Let me just check. My video is off. I think. Uh, yeah, my video is off. Where did you get up to? Yeah, we're exactly in this slide, but your voice is a bit delaying. But uh, anyway, just maybe the internet signal if, you're, if you just get closer to your uh, router. Okay. Fine, I'll, I'll carry on. And um, what, what I'll do is I'll send you an MP4. I'll record this again and I'll send you an MP4 so you've got it to give out to the guys. So the, the, two, the two chevrons, um, the two parallel chevrons consist of the long and short radial lunate ligaments. The short radial lunate ligament is important and we'll come back to that. The distal chevron consists of the radioscape of capitate and the ulnar capitate ligament. The reason that this is important is that there is an area of relative weakness between the two chevrons. And this is termed the space of Poirier. And this is the space through which the lunate dislocates if it dislocates through the front of the carpus. The dorsal extrinsic ligaments are also a chevron and their insertion is centered on the triquetra. They're the dorsal intercarpal and the dorsal radiocarpal ligament. This is important because one of the main approaches into the back of the carpus is to do either the Mayo or Berger approach, where this ligament is split along their fibers so that you can preserve them. The picture on the right demonstrates this approach and the ligamentous flap is under the uh, gelpi on the left hand side of the image and what you can see is the entirety of the back of the carpus. We'll go through Mayfield in a little bit more detail. So Mayfield 1 is a scapholunate ligament injury and Mayfield 2 is that in combination with a mid-carpal ligament injury. And Mayfield 3 is this in combination with a lunotriquetral ligament injury. So this is the classic perilunate injury. You can see that the capitate has dislocated relative to the lunate and the collinearity of the forearm and hand has been lost. And then finally, the Mayfield 4 is where the radiocarpal ligaments are injured and the lunate dislocates palmarly. And this is an example of a Mayfield 4. To outline the lunate, you can see that the purple lines depict where the lunate is on the radiographs. You can see that the lunate is perched on the front of the radius, and it's being held there by the short radiolunate ligament. I'll briefly talk about the instabilities. So a dissociative instability is where there is an injury within a row. So you can have an injury within the row causing instability within the proximal carpal row. 
and the most common example of this would be a scaphalunate ligament injury. You can also have an instability between the proximal and distal carpal row, and this is termed a non-dissociative instability. If you combine these two instabilities together, you can get a complex carpal instability, of which a perilunate is an example. So the purple arrow depicts the increasing mechanism of injury, and you can see that there is both instability within the proximal carpal row, but also potentially relative to the distal row and the radiocarpal joint. An important but rare complication is that of scaphocapitate syndrome. So this is a trans-scaphoid, trans-capitate injury. And you can see that the capitate body has fractured and the proximal pole of the capitate has actually flipped through 180 degrees. These have a poor prognosis and tend to lead to degenerative change. So how do we assess perilunate injuries? Well, they're holistic. You need to resuscitate them appropriately and ensure that this is an isolated injury. Take a thorough history. You want the handedness and all of the usual things. And when you examine them, you must ensure that their median nerve is intact. And then you would get your normal plain radiographs. You would assess Galula's lines, which we've talked about. There are two other radiological signs that you can see. The first is the piece of pi sign, which is this triangular image. And then the spilled teacup sign is the radiological sign where the lunate is perched on the palmar aspect of the radius. When thinking about how to look after perilunate injuries, it can be quite complicated. And I think from the perspective of exams, it's often better to divide them into emergency and definitive management. This makes it easier to think about. The emergency management, you want to treat this like any other joint. You want to reduce the joint. So how do you do that? Well, finger traps can be quite useful so that you get longitudinal traction and you can manipulate this in the emergency department either with an, a block or with sedation if that skill set is there. If you can't reduce them, I would take them to theatre that night and reduce them. The mechanism for the manipulation is you must always put your thumb over the carpal tunnel. And this is to prevent you forcing the lunate into the carpal tunnel. Converting a Mayfield 3 into a Mayfield 4 is not something you want to be presenting at the morning meeting. So you support the lunate with the thumb, put longitudinal traction on, and then you're trying to hitch the capitate back into the lunate. Once you've reduced the carpus, decompress the median nerve if there are any signs. I'm happy for this to be done in the operating theatre overnight and for the patient to be made safe. From the perspective of the FRCS, you can then say I would request a CT scan for further assessment and I'd refer on to my local hand surgery service. They will want you to talk about definitive treatment, so it's useful to have an idea of how this will play out. When I talk about perilunate courses, I'm often given multiple scenarios of what I would do if. So I've come up with six, the, the six common scenarios that I think happen. So if it's reduced in the emergency department as an inpatient, if it's reduced in the de emergency department, but there's persisting median nerve signs, I would advocate decompressing the median nerve that night. If it's not reduced in the emergency department, it needs to go to theatre for reduction. If you achieve a successful closed reduction in theatre, given the fact that these patients will either have had a decompressing the median nerve then, what you don't want to happen is for you to walk into the um, recovery room and find that they've got new median nerve symptoms after you've decompressed them. 
if you can't reduce them closed and you need to open and it's a Mayfield 4, do a Palmer approach. You will decompress the median nerve as part of this approach and reduce the lunate mandible. If it's a Mayfield 3, I would do the Palmer approach first, decompress the median nerve, and often with the front open, you're able to manipulate the wrist and reduce it. If you can't, then you would need to do another dorsal approach and reduce the lunate. Definitive treatments, if you think about these four things, that covers everything. So your definitive treatment is to reduce the lunate, hold the lunate reduced, you then reconstruct your injured structures and protect the repairs until they heal. If you remember those four things, it gives you a way through the uh, viva. These are examples of the common approaches. So this is the Palmer approach. The incision is in the left hand image and the right hand image, you can see that there is a, a rent in the soft tissues. That's where the lunate had dislocated through the space of plaque. The way that I do this approach is that I do a median nerve release first and I then extend it around so that I can get into the front of the carpus. That's the most straightforward way I think about doing this. What I would say is, is that in young fit people, the roof of the carpal tunnel is often nowhere near as thick as it is in those patients who have carpal tunnel um, syndrome. So you need to be careful about how you go through that roof. And then the dorsal approach is a standard dorsal approach. This is Burgess flap. And you can see here the entirety of the carpus. You can see the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and the distal carpal ring. So we've exposed the problem. A few tips and tricks for lesser arc injuries. What you're looking to do is to reduce the lunate relative to the radius and the capitate. So put your K wire into the lunate perpendicular to its long axis. This then gives you a visual aid to when it's reduced without you having to take radiographs. And put your K wire as distally as possible into the scaphoid because this gives you a better lever to be able to extend it and to reduce it relative to the lunate. You then put your wires in to protect the carpus and you can then do your soft tissue reconstructions. For greater arc injuries, I fix the bones first. I find this more straightforward and I work proximal to distal. So if there's a, rad a radius injury that needs fixation, I'd do that first to give the carpus a stable platform. And then I would fix the radius before I start putting wires into the rest of the carpus. Trans scaphoid perilunate fractures are, well, tend to be more comminuted and more difficult to reduce than normal scaphoid injuries. And I more commonly than not put two screws in because of their instability. And only once I'd fix the bones would I reconstruct the ligaments. Short um, section on outcomes. This is uh, the biggest data that we have. It's 166 perilunates from multiple centers. The tagline is that open injury and delayed treatment was a worse outcome and 56% had post-traumatic degenerative change. So not great. I particularly like this paper. It's a short um, series of 18 perilunates. And again, they had degenerative change in around 60%, but this didn't follow through into an effect on function. The reason I like this paper is that they've done a little systematic review. And this is the reason that I tell my patients that if they get three quarters of their range of motion and three quarters of their grip strength back, they'll be doing well. So as you can see from the red bars. So in summary, this is an uncommon injury. A quarter of them are missed. It's high energy. You have to explain to the patient that they will not get a normal wrist back. And if they're getting three quarters of range and three quarters of grip strength, they're doing well. 
and around 60% get conjunctive change. So thank you for listening. I'm sorry if my internet connection has been a bit unstable. Um, MP4 to Shamsi so that he can share it with you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I think Nick has discussed everything what is required for the exam and also some tips and tricks for the practice. Usually, what they is discuss all the scenarios in the exam, that's what they ask. Usually, whether you dis reduce it in the emergency, plus or minus, median nerve, do you open, which approach, everything is covered. If any questions, you can message Nick on the Zoom platform. Nick, will you, uh, you can join us back for the discussion, Nick, after an hour? Yeah, no problem. If you, can you restart my video, just so that I've got the power to, um, and um, yeah, I'll probably pop in and out and, and then pop back for the case discussions. I'm interested to hear what the other speakers have to say. Okay, no problem, Nick. So the next... Yeah, Dr. Shamsi, one more thing. So um, for the speakers, question and answers, uh, they can appear for the panels where uh, the attendee can make questions in the question and answer uh, tab. And uh, some questions, maybe we cannot get uh, enough time to answer them in the meeting. So speakers, they can answer privately on the question and answer by typing. Okay. And we have, anyway, we have a 40 minutes of discussion of cases. So we'll be covering all the topics which we covered in the lectures, each each case for similar kind of topic. So next topic, uh, we have Professor Anil Butt who will be speaking on tips and tricks for distal radius fracture fixation. Professor Anil Butt is the chief of hand and microsurgery unit at Kastro uh, Medical College and is associate dean of the college. Uh, he's one of the eminent uh, educator and speaker in India and is all the time giving lectures and teaching around. So uh, welcome, Dr. Anil. Uh, thank you, Shamsi. So is my screen visible? Yeah, you have to start the slides. Is it visible yeah. now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for this invite, uh, Shamsi. Shamsi and me go a long way back, uh, many, many years back. Uh, I also thank Dr. Alatik, who's the head of the department uh, at Qatar, and uh, of course, Fuad, Fadi, and Esam. And uh, my basic objectives of this talk is uh, clinical and radiological assessment of distal radius fractures, uh, the concept of stability itself, and then what it takes to decide on the type of treatment, the implant characteristics, few intra-technical pearls, and then cases where extra care is required. Uh, so this is the basic way I would run my talk. So. When you see a patient uh, in the triage with a distal radius fracture, of course, uh, I expect uh, my residents to at least report to me in this particular way as to, you know, clinical details, the history mechanism and comorbidities. Comorbidities are very important. If not asked in the first day, a lot of times it's forgotten. Uh, obviously, whether it's a closed or open fracture, associated injuries in the same limb, very, very important. A lot of times we do miss, uh, sim I mean, an injury just proximal in the near the elbow, other limbs or in the other systems. Any how bad is the swelling? Very important again, and the neurovascular status, of course. So, if these are given, uh, you know, sometimes things are sent on WhatsApp, things are called and told. But this minimum amount of clinical details is is very much required. And after the clinical examination, obviously, you would ask for an X-ray, and the routine views are PA and the lateral view. Oblique views are sometimes asked. But sometimes, again, based on your clinical examination, forearm x-rays uh, with wrist and elbow and scaphoid views are very important if clinical suspicion of any additional injuries are there. So the basic concept of looking you know, beyond and above is very, very important, one joint above and one joint below. Because uh, you shouldn't be looking at the distal radius as a single isolated entity like this. It's a part of a combined you know, forearm joint. It's very, very important, again, to look distally also into the radiocarpal area so that 
you don't miss any of these injuries so not concentrate everything around the distal radius you need to look all the all the areas distally to the side here and again proximally all the way up here a lot of times uh, injuries like a six lucristi or or missed now when you take an x-ray you develop your own checklist when you see the x-rays as you run through the x-rays on your pack system or any of these mentally take a take a uh, notice of all these things what is the bone stock is a fracture intraarticular or extraarticular if it's intraarticular what are the intraarticular components the height and inclination or how much of collapse has happened you don't really have to draw these lines but actually may make a mental picture of all these things what's happened to the articular surface as i said one joint above which is the radiocarpal joint scaphoid scaphalunate and lunate tricuspid intervals the druj especially the ulna head the sigmoid notch what's happened to the ulna styloid all these have to be taken care of or at least you know made a note of in your notes as to what what are the characteristics there intraarticular fractures especially if there is a step or a gap there it's very important which are the components probably seen on the x ray at least on the initial look what all the components are seen and what's happening to the neighboring joints so this is very very important as to what has happened to the x ray itself x ray gives a lot of information especially with the distal radius fracture the second concept is basically how you look at stability itself when you look at an x ray on a on a patient's x ray you need to know how stable that fracture is or how unstable it is so which which if at all there is a lot of combination especially the dorsal combination more than 50% if the angulation is really bad more than especially the dorsal tilt here shortening of more than a centimeter fracture patterns uh, shear kind of fracture patterns is a very unstable situation loss of opposition the displacement how much of displacement what's happened to the ulnar styloid base or is it displaced or not and of course the bone stock itself so when you have all these factors again it tells you that these are very unstable situations and when you have an unstable situation you should not it's not wise to hold on with unstable methods i mean when you have a really unstable fracture you need to think of whether your treatment is operative if operative what could be the implant which can hold these unstable fragments and there are situations where patient might not be ready for uh, a surgery and that time it's very important to document that this fracture is quite unstable right from the beginning and there might be complications there could be malunion there could be instabilities later on and that needs to be counseled and documented with the patient very important now there are numerous classifications as you all know and ideally a classification should guide the treatment and but here probably there's a combination of these classifications maybe uh required especially in distal radius you have the good old fritzmans classification which drew our attention to the radiocarpal and radio ulnar joints then you have the fragment specific classification where these fragments are then we have the regozones where we talk about column which column is majorly involved especially the intermediate column which a lot of times is not uh, you know clearly uh, visualized and of course finally the fernandez classification based on mechanism of action is probably one of the classification which gives you some treatment guideline as to why uh, something has happened and what you need to do about it and probably a combination of this you know which joints are involved which fragment is involved which column is involved and what is the mechanism of injury is probably one good thing for us to know and so that you can think about the treatment part of it so based on the mechanism of classification you have a bending type of fracture a lot of times extra articular you have a shear type you have a depression type like the avulsion type you have a depression type or you have a complex kind of a fracture like this or you do have something like this where there could be carpal instabilities just distal to the joint so you need to look at all these things when you look at the x ray itself the next concept is how to do a ct or when to do a ct rather so doing a close reduction is very very important and then getting a ct is very important for you to get more information as to those fragments especially the, when you talk of fragment specific which fragments are involved so where are these fragments so it's very vital that a close reduction is done or uh, taking an x ray and ct immediately back to back is not really useful because you really don't know you don't get much information uh, close reduction and then a ct scan would give you the exact uh, you know Uh, fragments where they are and what it can, what can be done for this now probably in your ifrcs exams this would be asked very clear uh, very uh, you know uh, commonly after your clinical radiological examination what is your uh, line of management and the question is uh, is it operative or a non operative kind of management how do you take the decision uh, here the 
factors, especially the physiological age and the functional demand of the patient is very, very important. And stability of the fracture, which we just ta talked about, is again one which will guide your management. And a shared decision making is very crucial for, for you to talk to the patient to understand uh, what they really require and what you want to do. And one of the guidelines, uh, the recent guidelines, 2018, uh, the British Orthopedic Association and the Hand Society, British Orthopedics, uh, I mean, Hand Society came together to get this best practice for management of this lady's fractures. These guidelines came out in 2018. And a lot of these have incorporated majority of these meta-analysis and RCTs and systematic reviews and synthesized the evidence for majority of these conditions. And for a patient's over age of 65 years, operative intervention does not provide a superior outcome to non-operative management. Uh, when you measure the patient uh, reported outcomes at about one year, of course, you need to take that uh, activity level, the fracture patterns and comorbidities into consideration before uh, decision making. That's why I said a shared decision is very, very important for, for the patient. Now, if you decide on non-operative treatment, Again, these questions are always asked, what would you do if you decide on a non-operative or a conservative type of management? It's very crucial that you follow them up in the first three weeks, especially uh, regularly, because especially those patients who had some displacement or combination in, on the initial fillings and you've reduced it, you've got a good close reduction, you need to follow them up, call them back and see what's happening in the first couple of weeks, uh, whether the, the fracture, fracture is settling down whether there's some collapse or and this this is this has to be discussed with the patient very very important again cast care is very important much more uh, difficult than actually implant care so you need to avoid extremes of movements like this you need to be aware of the tight cast and its complications and very very clear instructions have to be given to these patients this is a six week follow up this is a six month follow up and you know that there is a malunion here there is some amount of loss of height and inclination, but then patient is happy, the movements are fine, reasonable, and you already documented that this patient might have malunion, and patient has agreed for it, then it's fine. And that, that's a shared share decision making, which is very important, and uh, how you want to carry on with the treatment. But if you decide on an operative intervention, uh, you need to choose implants based on the fracture pattern and your expertise because wrong implants give poor results and you should not be blaming that on the implants itself. A, a depressed fractures like this or, or a shear fractures like this would require specific implants and a specific way of managing these fractures. If you decide on operative treatment, again, the NICE guidelines, which even the uh, later the BSSH adopted, uh, uh, also tells that if at all you decide on intraarticular fractures, it should be within the 72 hours of uh, injury. And if it was extra articular fracture within seven days of injury is good enough for you to do a surgery. Now, if there was a redisplacement when you have been doing an, a conservative kind of treatment, perform surgery within 72 hours after you decide to operate. So these are the basic guidelines uh, given uh, for you to take a decision on this. Now, operative treatment has progressed from reduction of deformity to anatomical reduction so it can achieve pre injury function. And so various type of implants, various methods of fixing is, is coming to work. So percutaneous spinning, external fixators, various types of plates, buttress plate, lock plate, rim and fragment specific plates, and new modalities like arthroscopic assisted kind of fixations, bridge plating, all these are there. So you need to choose what is best for that particular patient or for that particular pattern of fracture. Now, KYs, good old KYs, they're always there. They always will be there and always a good, good friend of a hand surgeon. So bending fractures like this, classic, your classic extraarticular fracture that you have two main fragments, probably is the best kind of fractures or very unstable extraarticular fractures or minimally displaced intraarticular fractures. These are the ones which probably have to be, uh, K wires have to be used. Now, the way you use it is very, very important. Uh, it's always a lot of times misused and abused. So especially a cross configuration like this would give you the best rotational stability. And then these, these, these wires should be crossing distal to the, I mean, sorry, proximal to the fracture site here. Very, very important. They don't cross at the fracture site here or distally, definitely. So this is very important concept. Again, you need to look at what's happening to DRUJ and other joints here. And even in the lateral view, they need to be spread out like this nicely. They shouldn't become parallel here so that you get a better hold of these fragments. And these wires definitely should not be used indiscriminately. We see sometimes a lot of K wires being put. This is almost a sheer kind of fracture here. 
but nothing will happen except that it will collapse, the DRUJ sublux states, finally ends up with some amount of couple instability. So again, if you look at the evidence itself, the, the very famous draft trial said there's absolutely no difference between KYs and uh, the plates. But then of course, if you look carefully at the trial itself, there are a lot of flaws in the trial itself as to the type of uh, you know recruitment, who did the surgery and so many other things. So you can't really take this as, as the final word on KYs. And, uh, so and there's again another meta-analysis, which again shows that there's not much data to show that one is better than the other. Each has its own role. Even now, KYs and plates probably have their own roles in certain types of fractures. This kind of uh, uh, KY usage with so much of combination here with a DRUJ, a sigmoid notch injury here and a DRUJ injury here, will definitely, it is definitely doomed to fail if so the implant, the KOR should not be blamed in this. Probably the surgeon should be blamed because of not using them uh, appropriately. So if there is significant combination, there's a great chance of collapse. If you treat with just plaster or only KYs, and one of the ways is probably an external fixator. I don't know how much uh, external fixator is used in your scenarios, in your settings. Uh, I'm sure all of you know the concept of ligament taxes. There's an alternate theory where a vacuum effect on the structures is created through distraction. So it works when one of these basically telling that the soft tissues have to be relatively intact and uh, for this to work nicely. You can bridge the joint or there could be non-bridging or a non-spanning kind of a fixation. But then again, you should know how to use it and when to use them. If you have something like this, the depressed kind of a fracture element here and you need to distract so much here that this radiocarpal gap increases so much here like this, this is again doomed to cause a lot of, lot of uh, complications, stiffness, CRPS, all these, all these are problems with this kind of a thing. Again, is something like this here, right? So if you if you take a traction view in your OT, whether you're doing a closed reduction KY fixation or you're doing a plate fixation or an X-fix fixation, the first step for you to do is to do a closed reduction and check in the OT what's happening to the fragments, how the fragments are falling, where are they, and then probably change your decision or you know augment with something with another implant. So. Don't make plans until you see the traction view uh, in the triage or in the OT and then take a decision on that. Now, again, looking at the evidence of external fixation versus ORIF, you, you do have some amount of evidence that not much of difference between these two. Uh, here it says that that difference is not clinically meaningful in this study. Another meta-analysis shows that the inter internal fixation is much better in terms of functional outcome. And again, you know, not much of, so external fixator again has its own role, uh, but probably a limited role once now the plate osteosynthesis has come. You can use both the techniques, the K-wires and the external fixator itself. Uh, you can joystick the fragments percutaneously or a minimally open kind of reduction and then use the ex external fixator. So you can have a combination of this if you are used to this kind of a technique. But then once the plates came in, I think uh, there was a paradigm shift in terms of using them much, much more. Again, probably the cycle will go back, but then otherwise, right now, uh, all over the world, most of the time, the most sought after implant would be a, a, a plate. So again, various, uh, various things you need to think about when you start using the plate, right from which type of plate, uh, where to get to be placed, what is exposure, and what you do intraoperatively. I'll just run through that quickly. So if you look at the distal radius itself, uh, the dorsal side is, is not smooth and uniform and you have the Lister's tubercle and the older plates failed because of this. People had to remove the Lister's tubercle and the plates were not low profile. But with the new low profile plates and smaller plates, I think there are indeed definitely indications, especially at this corner here, the dorsal lunate facet kind of an injury would be a classical indication for a dorsal plate. But if you look at the OLR surface, beautifully probably just made for a plate fixation. So majority of the surgeons would go towards a OLR plate kind of fixation and have specific indications for the dorsal side or sometimes even on the lateral uh, kind of plates. Design-wise, there are extra-articular plates, there are juxta-articular plates, there are rim plates which, which cross the watershed line, there are very fragment-specific plates which can be all, can be fixed angle or variable angle. Now, your incision, basically your modified Henry's can be turned either way more radially or towards the ulna side based on where your major fragments are. Or sometimes you go with an extended kind of an FCR approach or a carpal tunnel approach when you have a major fragments in this area in the intermediate column like this. Now the concept of watershed line needs to be very clear as to 
what is it? So it's basically telling that that the parietal quadratus uh, muscle here, which stops at this area, and then the capsule is here. The junction is your watershed line. So the tendon here inserts somewhere here at this point, and the capsule takes off here, and that is this is the junction where uh, the line is, or you know, uh, the the area is. And the and the significance of that is your regular ola plates very nicely sit in this parietal quadratus fossa here like this. So nicely contoured plates here, but as you keep them more distally, if you make it more proud, and if these are not low profile, this, this edge becomes quite prominent here. And then one of the important tendons is the FPL tendon. So that starts getting irritated and attrition. And so that is why the concept of uh, you know not crossing the watershed line came into this, where you had plates which are not meant to cross the watershed line. The implants were quite... Uh, uh, high profile in the sense that they were quite thick and they were not low profile implants like this. And uh, so you need to go till the junction they're exposed and see for, before you decide on, on the placement of your plates. Now, once you do that, the next is to take off the parietal quadratus as nicely as possible. And there are various scenarios here where you have a nice thick parietal quadratus like this in, in this patient. But a lot of times you might not get a very thick parietal quadratus in some patients, it could be very flimsy. Again, there'll be a lot of you know damage to the pronator quadratus muscle itself. With a, with a fracture is really bad. It will be all lacerated at this point here. But even then, as much as possible, try to take the take it off as as neatly as possible so that you can cover the plate uh, later on as uh, as nicely there. And always keep a rim of periosteum along with the muscle fibers here so that you can suture this back nicely to this this area here. So that that the section will take some time, but then it's worth doing it. The second thing is, again, during your dissection, you would see this kind of picture where there's a lot of radial translation here. And this is not a good thing in terms of the alignment itself. I mean, and it also has a bearing on the DRUG. And brachioradialis is a deforming force definitely in these situations. Again, during your dissection, if you can take away the brachioradialis all the way there, it makes your life easy to reduce these fragments. Uh, with this radial translation, the fragments will come back nicely here. And there's a broad attachment here and you don't really do, uh, do any uh, damage there. Once you put in the plate, uh, the next thing is to make sure your, your screws are uh, kept or uh, put properly. And that's when your intraop radiology will come into picture. The tilt views are very important. You know the normal palma tilt here. And only if you raise it and neutralize it, uh, the, the entire profile of the joint will come into picture like this. So if you have a doubt that some of these screws are gone into the joint here. You need to make sure that you do the tilt view, take it off the table, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, it depends on the patient's palmar tilt. But then you would see that they are not actually in the joint by doing this. Again, uh, PA view, PA uh, screw in the joint. Again, if you have any doubt, the same kind of maneuver here can be done. And the styloid oblique view is, is one more thing. You can screen the patient there because this styloid screw always looks very prominent and very long. But then if you can screen the patient on table, you will know that this, this is definitely not inside the joint and it's going all the way to the styloid. So these are the basic things you do. And then you have these dorsal uh, projecting screws, the proud screw, very, very important for irritating the extensor, uh, extensor tendon here. And the culprit always is the Lister's tubercle, which hides these screw tips here. And that is the one. So if you draw this line, the dorsal subcondral plate line, if you draw this from this edge here, you will know how many of these are quite prominent and these should these are the ones which will cause damage so another way of looking at it is it's a tangential view like this and you would see these screws here quite prominent one more view is a carpal shoot view which we do again here with articular surface to see which frag which uh, screw is quite proud and needs to be revised so these are the basic intraoperative radiology you need to do and once you're confirmed your screws are all fine then you close this uh, uh, printer quadratus as much as possible. Again, make sure that uh, the most important structure is the FPL, which has to glide here near the edge of the plate. So if your plate is proud, definitely you would need to cover that edge of the plate. And a lot of times it might be difficult to close the printer quadratus. One of the basic mechanism you use is the creep phenomenon, where you try to put in a knot there for there, wait for some time here. Uh, so that the muscle relaxes and then maybe it becomes much easier for you to suture the entire uh, muscle tissue. So it's very important that this edge should be uh, closed as much as possible. Otherwise, see, so this is the FPL gliding there. 
and that is that is the edge there so as long as if we can cover some soft tissues at the edge of the uh, plate there these tendons will be protected and the fpl attrition is much less if you have an ulnar styloid fractures tip fractures base fractures like this which are displaced probably is one which indicates that they are a druj uh, uh, is unstable uh, doesn't mean that all of them have to be fixed it's very very important that you assess them uh, clinically and see what's happening so after your fixation always make sure that you check do your belotment test and see how unstable the, the joint itself is and then take a decision what is to be done there are secondary uh, stabilizers uh, in the joint for the distal radio ulna joint you have the pronata quadratus which has been lifted up for the plate fixation you have the interosseous membrane with the oblique bundles you have the ecu subsheet then you have the tfcc so any of these could be injured but our basic thing is we want the soft tissues to heal so you can reduce this pin it across keep it for about 3 weeks and then mobilize or you can just put a slab for 3 weeks above elbow slab and then wait for 3 weeks and then uh, mobilize these patients and then probably the soft tissues would heal well <coughs> if you really want to fix this it always probably needs to be a mini open kind of an incision here and it's it's always under vision you fix these fragment you can't blindly percutaneously do this kind of a fixation in these fractures uh two important injuries one is the lunate facet injury is a very deceptive injury here always lot of times is taken for granted that's a very simple injury it's not so and uh, always get the ct done to see where the fragments are okay and then make sure those fragments are caught by see this this volar rim is a keystone for these two joints and it's it's considered as the achilles heel for radial fractures radial distal radius fractures a lot of failures happen if you don't don't try to fix this and two important angles and uh, distance you need to, the ap distance here is what tells you that there might be damage to the entire uh, uh, apparatus there and here you have the depressed ear drop angle here again tells that that lunate facet is is damaged here so these are things you need to look at in the x rays you enhance this fixation sometimes we put a dedicated screw to this fragment and make sure at least two screws go into these uh, into these lunate facet that's very very important so that you hold it up and and nicely fix it if required put in another extra screw like this a lack kind of a screw or sometimes i would put a wire here hold it and maybe remove it at 3 weeks so these are the ways you need to hold that fragment sometimes you follow these patients even if you are put into screws slowly they they start collapsing so if there was less than 15 mm of the lunate facet available for fixation or greater than 5 mm of initial lunate subsidence these are risk at risk at failure even if you put a volar plate uh, properly so this is the problem with this fracture you need to go through the carpal tunnel approach like this and then if you have dedicated plates you need to use them so this is almost like a lunate facet kind of fracture and these are the hook plates dedicated plates the tines will go through a pre-drilled hole into the into the surface here and then you can have these fragments specific kind of a fixation for these fragments the other important injury is a very high energy rim fractures completely kind of exploded the entire articular surface exploded you might have free intraarticular fragments here and uh, basically it's where the soft tissues are the the, the ligaments are uh, the radio scapula capitate the uh, radio lunate ligaments here dorsal radio carpal ligaments all these are the ones which are pulling the fragments off and the watershed line no longer remains sacrosanct here you need to cross this but it's with the proper implants especially low profile implants and you have the rim plates here which can cross all the way till the edge of the uh, distal radius here and these are very low profile plates so there is no much of tendon or soft tissue irritation and you have different types of uh, plates uh, and the good thing is the the screws go proximally like this so they don't go distally like this they go proximally they directed proximally and you can hold the fragments here so this is again a case where we have used both the rim plate and the fragment specific plates sometimes you might not be able to put in the screws here and you might have to use sutures through this or very bad comminuted fractures you might have to use a distraction kind of a plate in an internal distraction plate which can be removed after 3 to 4 months so we have gone through the entire concept of what is stability of the fracture which are unstable fixations the concept of one joint above one joint below what happens in a non operative treatment with a good follow up operative treatment how do you judiciously use the implant which one to use when the concept of again watershed line the lunate facet what happens during surgery intraop radiology for looking at projecting screws into the joint dorsally 
and the screening for three, 360 degree kind of a screening and of course the DRUJ stability itself. So these are the things you run through when you, when you see a patient uh, with a distal radius fracture and make sure that this checklist is always there in your mind when you treat these patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anil. So we have covered all the topic distal radius well and almost all the tips and tricks. But I'm sure again, distal radius is always a confusion for all of us to take a decision. I mean, the ones who don't do only rest, it's always difficult for us to decide whether decision making. I still find it difficult to decide whether it's KY, X fix, or a plate. So we have a, a discussion time. So uh, for we'll be discussing some com complex cases with Dr. Anil. So next we'll go for the next topic. Fawad, uh, Fawad is ready? Yes, Dr. Shem. So next topic is by Dr. Fadi. He's our uh, specialist who's just come back from his uh, hand and for his fellowship from US Louisville. So for the FASIX exam, usually uh, there are a few topics which are very important for the exams. And at the end of the discussion for the VIVA or the short case, when you give a decision making, they expect you to know the evidence. And believe me, it's very difficult to remember all the evidence for the entire orthopedy. So you have to have a list of topics for which you have to know the evidence, like uh, CMC arthritis, distal radius, a gang, a sim something simple as a ganglion, which sounds very simple, but it's high chance of failure for the exam. They expect you to know everything from decision making to the ev latest evidence. So Fadi will be covering the uh, few evidence which you have to know for the FASIS exam specifically. Okay, Fadi. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good afternoon and good morning. First of all, thank you, Dr. Shams and Dr. Hassan for giving me this chance to participate in this webinar. Uh, today, I have a short talk about evidence in hand and wrist for the most common topics to be asked in the boards and specifically the FRCS exam. Uh, so these are the most important topics you will encounter in the exam. You need to know that some papers that about each subject to support your answer in the exam. So we're gonna discuss it briefly about distal radius fractures, scaphoid fractures, ganglion cyst, Dupuytren's disease, uh, thumb CMC osteoarthritis, carpal tunnel syndrome, and complex regional pain syndrome. So the first topic is distal radius fracture, one of the most common topics to be asked about. And if they show you an X-ray with a distal radius dorsally displaced fractures, and you want to treat it, so the question will be either to uh, to go for KY fixation or a vora locking plate. So you can choose any treatment depending on your training experience and what you are comfortable with, but you have to support your answer. This is an important trial, which Dr. Anil already talked about it, which uh, you can refer it to, to it in the exam. It's called the DRAFT-1 trial, which comes from the Distal Radius Acute Fracture Fixation trial number one, which was done in UK involving 18 centers with follow-up up to 12 months. So they involve distal radius, dorsally displaced fracture that are only extra articular or simple articular, where the articular surface can be reduced with indirect techniques. So in their result, they found no difference in functional outcomes between the two groups at three months, six months, and final at 12 months. And also they found no difference also in the health-related quality of life and risk of complication. And also they found that the KY fixation is more of a cost-effective procedure. And then also extra, you can mention that there is another trial still going on, which is the draft two trial, comparing the K-wire versus the plaster. But this trial is still not finished yet. So it's worth to mention it so to get the higher score. And also as Dr. Anil talked, you have to review also the British Society uh, of Hand Surgery guidelines for the distal radius fracture. Next topic is a scaphoid fractures. Also it's important in the exam where you want to choose between surgery or conservative treatment of scaphoid waste on displaced fracture. This study uh, done in 2018, which is a meta-analysis and a systematic review about surgical versus non-surgical treatment of scaphoid waste fractures. And the results show no significant difference between both groups regarding patient satisfaction, pain, and functional outcomes. And they found also that close treatment shortened the time to union with early return to work. And open reduction reduces the incidence of non-union. 
So as a conclusion, the surgeon can decide treatment according to the patient's situation and need, as the evidence cannot establish which method is superior. And again, if you want to score higher, it's worthy to tell the examiner about the ongoing trial in UK by Dr. Dias, which is involving 17 hand centers with a follow-up up to five years. So it's a randomized controlled trial comparing the cast versus surgery. It's still going on and not finished yet. Uh, the, another important topic is ganglion cyst. So you might think it's an easy topic, but most of the candidates usually fail in this station because they underestimate it. And the examiners usually dig very deep in the question. And as you know, there are multiple treatments for ganglion cysts like observation, aspiration, and surgical excision. And you need to be familiar with the pathophysiology and various presentations and support your answer for the treatment. So this is an updated evidence with a systematic review and meta-analysis in 2015 in the Journal of Hand Surgery by Dr. Head from Canada, which includes two randomized controlled trials and four cohort studies. And here you can see the forest plot for both RCTs and cohort studies, showing the significant reduction in recurrence with surgery compared to aspiration. So their results showed that open excision offers a lower chance of recurrence compared to aspiration. And about arthroscopic excision, that data are limited and no confirmed superiority. And most important, that aspiration provides no benefit compared to observation alone in terms of resolution of ganglion. And if the examiner asks you about percentage, you can give him percentage for the recurrence rate and complications. The recurrence rate for arthroscopic is 6%, the open is 21%, and aspiration is 59%, while the complication rate for the arthroscopic is 4%, the open is 14%, and aspiration is a 3%. And here you have to remember these two papers by Dr. Dias, which are commonly cited and accepted as a reference in the exam for both palmar and dorsal ganglion. And the conclusion of both studies that there is no difference in outcome and patient symptoms on the long term between excision, aspiration, and observation. And finally, before you go to the exam, you should review this protocol of treatment by the British Society of Hand Surgery, and then you can really score high in the ganglion station. The next topic is the Dupuytren's disease, which is very common in Europe, and you should be familiar with the pathogenesis and the risk factors. And regarding treatment, many methods are there, from observation to non-invasive treatment to surgery. And the final decision usually to debate is collagenase injection versus a percutaneous needle fasciotomy. So this paper is a level one evidence, randomized controlled trial from Sweden by Dr. Strumberg in the JPGS in 2018, comparing the collagenase injection versus the percutaneous needle fasciotomy. And the final results show that there is no advantage of collagenase injection over the percutaneous needle fasciotomy in term of a clinical outcome at any time during the two years follow-up. Also, an interesting conclusion by them to explain the results that the significant decrease in the number of pathological cords after disruption, regardless of the method, may indicate that the resorption of the pathological collagen occurs when the tension in the cord is diminished. Also, you don't have to forget that the collagenase injection is more expensive, so you can tailor your answer according to your experience and training and relate to the patient condition. Uh, the next topic is the thumb CMC osteoarthritis, and as you know, there are many ways of surgical treatment for this uh, uh, arthritis, and the final decision you have to make is it a trapezectomy or a trapezectomy and ligament reconstruction and tender interposition. So one of the most important papers that you have to mention in the exam is the one by Dr. Davis from Nottingham, UK. It is a randomized prospective study that compared both techniques. And in their results, they found no significant difference between the two techniques in terms of functional outcome scores, pain, pain and pinch strength at three months and one year follow-up. So you can answer according to your training and which procedure you are more comfortable with. Also to score higher in this station, you can relate to the most updated evidence in the Cochrane Library about the SUMCMC, which involves 11 studies. Most, most of them are randomized controlled trial comparing all types of surgery around the trapezium. 
In their results, the first thing is that they didn't find any study that compared surgery to a sham surgery or surgery with non-surgical intervention. And their final conclusion that no surgery is superior over the other in terms of pain, functional outcomes, complications, and reoperation rate. So this can also defend your decision. The next topic is the carpal tunnel syndrome, which is very common and you can be asked in deep details about it. And the important question regarding treatment is to go open or endoscopic surgery. A lot of debate between surgeons regarding accepting the endoscopic approach from the point of being expensive and more risk of nerve injury. But the advocates of the endoscopy claim that it offers less post-operative pain, scar, and early return to work. So to know this, the best paper to relate to this topic in the exam is by Dr. Atrushi from Sweden, who publishes about the difference between the two techniques in a three consecutive papers. So the first one is from the British Medical Journal in 2006, which is a randomized controlled trial comparing the endoscopic and open surgery with a 12 month follow up. And they found that the endoscopic is associated with less post operative pain but the difference is not clinically significant. And also they found no significant difference between both in the term of return to work, severity of symptoms and functional outcomes. Then he came up with an extension of his original trial, but with five year follow up in 2009. And then he did another extension of the trial with an average about 12 years follow up in 2015, which is the longest follow up ever published. And they both found no significant difference between both techniques in all outcome measures at the final follow-up. Now, it's worthy to be aware of the most recent updates in this topic, especially if you want to defend your answer as an endoscopic surgery. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials from China, published in April 2020. And these are the samples of the forest plots comparing both techniques in different outcomes. And their results, they found no significant difference in the operative time, grip strength, and functional outcome scores. And the other thing that the endoscopic surgery has higher satisfaction rate, greater key pinch, earlier return to work, and lower incidence of scar related complications. But it has higher transient nerve injury rates. And the interesting thing, interesting thing about this, that the permanent nerve injury showed no significant difference between both methods. So they conclude that endoscopic technique is an effective method of treatment with possibility of a transit nerve injury that you should tell the patient about it. Now, our last topic is the complex regional pain syndrome and distal radius fracture. And you will be asked whether to give vitamin C or not as it is a common practice between surgeons to give it after distal radius fractures. So this is a randomized controlled trial from the JPGS in 2014 done in UK about the influence of vitamin C on the outcomes of the distal radius fracture. So they found no benefit of administration of vitamin C with a displaced or an undisplaced fracture of the distal radius. And then another paper to support your answer from the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2015 by Dr. Bendari and his colleagues from Canada. It is a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. And they also share the same findings of there's no benefit of vitamin C in this delay distraction. Okay, so this is all about these topics and thank you for listening and good luck in your exams. Thank you. Thank you, Fabi. Uh, that was a pure exam-oriented topic. I would advise whoever is giving the exam to uh, save the presentation so you don't have to keep searching for the papers and it's easier to have a, to remember a few papers rather than try to remember a lot of papers because you have a lot of to topics in other speciality also. So the next lecture we have Dr. Chaitanya Mudgil from Boston. He's a hand and upper limb surgeon at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Associate Professor of Orthopedics at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Chetina for taking trouble on a weekend and early morning at 6 a.m. to give us the lecture. Uh, are you on, Dr. Chetina? Yeah, can you see my slides? Yeah, it's fine, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to join you in this webinar. It's an honor, and I'm uh, delighted to be here. It's not 
too early for me. This is normally when I'm awake and I'm already at work by now. So uh, this is fun. Now, my talk is a little, uh, maybe a little different. It's more of a philosophical talk. And it's meant to make people think about um, what we're going to talk about the next half hour. Not so much, so, <clears throat> excuse me, not so much so for me to tell you what to do, but I want you to think about what we're going to talk about. So here's a 15 year old female who came to me with a six month old injury, um, was told it was just a sprain. And uh, when she came to me with all these investigations, now all of you know that this is a very familiar setting in the clinic. So that is why we are going to talk about um, the ununited scaphoid. And what I'm going to provide to you are contemporary evidence-based perspectives to some extent and personal bias perspectives to some extent. So you're going to have to take that judiciously. So let's see, now why did we freeze here? Okay, so the five things I want you to understand is uh, factors in causation. How does an ununited fracture of the scaphoid evolve? How do you evaluate it? Follow a treatment algorithm. Now mind you, this is an algorithm, it's a guideline. I don't want you to use it as a fait accompli or a, um, a guideline more than anything than that, okay? And how do you finally do a non-union repair? Because I think knowing the theoretical aspect is a good thing, but at the end of the day, as a surgeon, you should be able to address it. So first things first, the best way to treat a non-union is not to have one or minimize one. So to minimize a non-union, the best thing to do is fix any fractures which are displaced more than a millimeter, fix any fractures that may be comminuted, fix all proximal pole fractures, and avoid a delay in diagnosis and treatment. We know that proximal pole fractures take longer to heal, and uh, that's a good reason to fix them. We also know that proximal pole fractures can be displaced without adequate imaging, and it's always a good idea to get a CT in them. And finally, we know from Tom Trumbull's data that any, uh, a delay in diagnosis of greater than three weeks is associated with a reduction in union rates of 50%. So once you decide you're not gonna let a scaphoid not go on to non-union, you have to understand as you assess a scaphoid, when should you consider it as ununited? Well, if you immobilized a scaphoid adequately and appropriately for six months and there is no evidence of radiographic union, then that may be considered as a non-union. But you have to remember that the six month guideline is really a very, very arbitrary guideline which has been taken from long bone data. It's nothing to do with the scaphoid really. So it's a very arbitrary guideline and then the question is, if you see no evidence of union at three months or two months, should you really consist, uh, persist with non-operative treatment? I.e., can you consider this an impending or a nascent non-union? I tend to do that. So how does the scaphoid non-union evolve? Well, initially it'll start off with a linear defect, as you can see here. It then goes on to form a cyst, and the progression from a linear defect to a cyst can be very rapid in teenagers, or it may take a long time. It's very difficult to predict that in some fractures. The cyst then converts to a cyst and a collapse. And finally, you go on to a scaphoid non-union advanced collapse or a snack wrist. But does every scaphoid non-union go on to a snack wrist? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Or does the fracture pattern help you to predict whether a scaphoid non-union will go on to a snack wrist? Well, let's go back and look at Fisher's, Herbert and Fisher's classification from 1984. So if you look at this, this is a B1 fracture, which is distal oblique, and a B2 fracture, which is a complete transverse. Is it possible that these may behave differently? And if so, why? Well, the Japanese group, including Nakamura and Moritomo, have shown wonderful data which shows us that if you have a B2 fracture where you have a transverse fracture line, which is largely placed distal to the attachment of the scaphoid lunate interosseous ligament, then your distal fragment can flex, leading to a greater chance of a humpback and a DC. On the other hand, if you have a B1 fracture where the fracture line extends proximal 
to the attachment of the scaphalonate interosseous ligament, i.e. within the confines of the scaphalonate interosseous ligament, then the chances of a humback are reduced as are the chances of DC, as you can see in this cartoon on the right, which therefore suggests that all scaphoid non-unions are not equal and some of them can progress rapidly to a DC while others may not. Here's a 64-year-old male who came to see me for some other reason and he had a fracture of unknown age. And you can see this, that this is a B1 fracture, which has gone on to form cyst formation. And in addition, they, he had not much of a DC to speak of. So another case in point being a 26 year old female who I took care of for an elbow fracture dislocation. And she had a distant vague history of a fracture which had been casted 12 for 12 weeks, nine years prior. Now you can see that she doesn't have a DC as you can see in this view here. But when you look at her CT, you see that she has a B1 type fracture, which has not healed at all. So case in point being, remember that all scaphoid fractures will progress, um, but the degree of progression and the development of a snack is not always a given, and that the fracture pattern may have a bearing on whether that happens or not. If a fracture progresses to snack, then what you will see is early cyst formation within 10 years. You will get radioscaphoid degenerative disease within 10 to 20 years. And finally, pancarpal arthrosis within 20 to 30 years. So I'm going to raise the bar here and ask you, just because an X-ray looks like this, ask yourself, are they all symptomatic? Or do you see patients all the time who come to you with really bad advanced disease, but they're not symptomatic? So that was the philosophical aspect of things. Now let's talk about nuts and bolts. If you have a non-union that is symptomatic, how do you assess it with a view to treating it? The first order of business is you get a standard three x-rays and a scaphoid view. And then if you are planning a repair in resource poor environments, it's good to get a contralateral wrist x-ray, which might help you have a template so as to restore scaphoid dimensions. A CT is always a good idea, especially if you want to assess the humpback and cystic change because that helps you re recontour the scaphoid back to its original dimensions. But here's the key. You cannot do a CT of the wrist. You have to do a CT of the scaphoid, which means it must be along the long axis, which allows you to assess the intra-scaphoid angle as shown here on the left, or the width and height ratio, which is shown here on the right. The two of these measurements are good for theoretical discussions, but when it comes to practical considerations, it really is the question of assessing whether there's a humpback or not so that you can repair it. What about an MR? We talk about using an MR to assess vascularity. Now, I want you to go away from thinking of lack of vascularity as avascular necrosis. That is a very flawed concept and one that you should be removing from your uh, uh, knowledge base. Avascular necrosis implies not only loss of vascularity, but cell death. That's a pathological diagnosis. What you see in a scaphoid which is not getting blood supply is not avascular necrosis. It is disvascularity, and there's a big difference between the two. We know from Mark Cohen's data that every scaphoid waist fracture, if you were to get an MR for first three months before they heal with non-operative treatment, will show signal changes in the proximal pole until the fracture has healed and revascularization has been established. So should you consider that avascular necrosis? Should you call it that? Absolutely not. That scaphoid is going through a period of transient disvascularity, and it's an important concept to understand. The second thing to understand is, if you were to take a micro CT of the scaphoid and count the number of trabeculae in the distal pole versus that in the proximal pole. What you're going to see is that the number of trabeculae in the proximal pole are more to begin with, which means the proximal pole is denser to begin with. Therefore, saying that plain X-ray increased density in the proximal pole indicates avascular necrosis is a flawed concept. So therefore, what I'm going to say to you is, please do not refer to it as avascular necrosis 
think of it more as dysvascularity. So we talk about getting an MR to assess vascularity of the proximal pole. But for those of you who are intimately as, uh, aware of the data that comes out from uh, Tim Davis's group, they looked at it and they found that an MR is not necessarily indicative of vascularity of the proximal pole, and it doesn't matter which way you look at it, whether it's T1, T2, or gadolinium. And even punctate bleeding by itself intraoperatively is not a great indicator. Therefore, for me personally, the use of an MR has largely become redundant and superfluous, and I do not use it any longer. So what do you do when you want to consider surgery? I look at the stage of non-union. Is there arthritis or not? Do I have enough bone geometry to play with? That helps me decide what approach I will use in the hardware. Is there dysvascularity? Is it a child or an adult? And finally, are they smokers or not? Do they have any comorbidities which will have adverse influences on the outcome? So here's my basic algorithm. Again, like I said, you have to take this as a brief guideline and not a line drawn in the sand. If it's a waist fracture with no humpback and a perfuse proximal pole, I simply just graft it or fix, uh, graft it through the screw track before fixing it, or just use a screw. If there is a humpback and a perfuse proximal pole, I use a trapezoidal graft, and I'll show you an example of that. If it's a humpback with a disvascular proximal pole, I still use trapezoidal graft with fixation. I have placed this here, a vascularized bone graft, for the sake of argument and for being controversial, but I'll show you the data in a little bit, which may help you understand why I don't use it anymore. For proximal thirds, it is basically internal fixation and bone grafting. And if it is uh, disvascular, I used to use vascular as bone graft and I've gone away from it over the last 10 to 15 years. Choices of approach, very simple. If it's a waist or distal third, I go volar. And if it's proximal, I go dorsal. So now that you have a guideline, the next thing to know is how do you do the operation? So here's this young girl we saw, the one who was injured six months prior. And if you look at what we just talked about, she has a distal third fracture. She has a humpback. And she came to me with an MR. Mind you, I did not get this MR. And you can see that the proximal pole, pole exhibits vascularity. Therefore, using the algorithm we talked about, she will need a trapezoidal graft. We will use a volar approach, and there is no need for adding perfusion. So the trapezoidal graft technique was described by Jeffrey Fisk uh, from the UK nearly 60 or 70 years ago, but he used the distal radius to harvest the graft. Diego Fernandez in 1984, as shown by this paper, felt that uh, it was better to use iliac crest graft, and that's what I tend to use. So this is my incision, a lazy hockey stick kind of incision and the one on the iliac crest, you have to be one inch posterior to the anterior superior iliac spine to avoid any chance of injury to the medial femoral cutaneous nerve. And when I get down to the capsule, I simply make a longitudinal capsulotomy. I do not rely on quote unquote anatomic capsulotomies. They do not make a difference in my opinion. Once you get down to the capsule, you have to be really, really careful of not making sure you do not put your home and retractor in this location. This is the dorsal ridge and that's where your vascularity is coming in from. If you strip this, you're basically making the scaphoid disvascular even distally. I use 0.062 inch Kirshner wires to jack the scaphoid open. Uh, it is 1.6 millimeters. And this shows you the rongeured out base of the trapezium because that is where we are gonna go into the scaphoid with your screw. Now you can see that we have opened this up and then you harvest the iliac crest. So this is a guideline again, please do not make this about the dimensions. More often than not, in most adults, you will find that a scaphoid graft is usually five to six millimeters in the proximal distal width, eight to nine millimeters in the ulno radial width, and eight to nine millimeters in the volar dorsal depth, okay? So this is the formula I tend to use, and more often than not, it works for me. You take the graft and after you harvest it and tailor it, you drop it in. And here's the key. Before you drop it in, you have to pack cancellous bone grafts so the transverse surfaces are established on either side of the scaphoid. And then you drop the graft in into, so that you have contiguous flat surfaces making contact and there's no cysts left behind. The most important thing is 
When you release your K wires and the graft is dropped in, the construct must be stable so that it almost behaves like it's already been fixed. After that, all you have to do is place your guide wire and the blue arrow points to your graft. You have to make sure that the guide wire is center center in all angles, and then you fix it with the screw. Now, you, you cannot be presumptuous and think that every scaphoid fracture or non-union that you repair is going to go on to heal uneventfully. There is a possibility it may not still heal, in which case, if you use the biggest screw to start off with, you're going to be in trouble if you have to revise it. So I tend to go with one screw size smaller in the Accutrack system so that if I have to revise it, I can always go to a bigger screw. Capsular closure may be difficult, and you have to remember that because you restored length of the scaphoid, you restored its dimensions. So your capsular closure may not be perfect. Don't fret about it because you're going to cast them and it's going to heal with scar formation just fine. I then put them in beautiful casts, and this is just incidental. This young lady had to go for a prom, so she wore this. And they go on to heal in most circumstances very, very uneventfully to give you a predictable outcome following these guidelines. Well, what about pediatric non-unions? You cannot forget the humble K-wire. Why do I say that? Well, these pictures are from Dr. Fernandez's original paper from 1984, and you're going to see here at the bottom that he had fixed his non-unions with K-wires. So do not get caught up in the misconception that unless you have a screw, your repair is going to be inadequate. It's not about the hardware. It's about following principles. So again, Dan Nagel, not too long ago, showed his own data where he used distal radius bone graft for a scaphoid non-union repair, fixed it with K-wires with excellent outcomes. So here's someone I took care of, this young man who was uh, a very small, 10 to 12 year old. And the problem with using screws here is the scaphoid is not completely ossified. So the chances of you having a perfect screw length are minimal because you really don't know how wide the scaphoid is. Therefore, using K wires is perfectly reasonable and they are multiple and they're left subcutaneous and they're taken out at about eight to 10 weeks. In this case, this patient also had, if you can appreciate it, a small osteochondroma. So we excise that at the same time and harvested the bone graft from the distal radius, and he went on to heal his scaphoid just fine, and the osteochondroma is gone. So the K-wires work. Now, what if you decide, well, I don't want to use a structural bone graft. Well, there is data to support that as well. We just looked at this uh, from Dan Nagel series, and more recently, Mark Cohen published his own data where they looked at it, doing it this way. Here's someone with a humpback. Now, you heard me say that I use a trapezoidal graft, but that's because that's the way I was trained. But can you do it without a trapezoidal graft? And increasing data shows that, yes, you can. You open it up in exactly the same way that I showed you before. Once you established your defect, you place an anti-rotation wire dorsally, and your screw goes in further dorsally. So that after your screw has been placed, these two act to keep the uh, scaphoid non-union jacked open, and then, you pack it full of graft on the volar surface. So you see from the CT from Mark Cohen's paper that the screw is placed much dorsally right there and the entire volar portion is filled with graft. So is it possible to make a scaphoid heal without a trapezoidal graft? Absolutely, and there is data to support that concept. How about these nascent non-union? This is a young man who has seen it in another facility with this fracture, which is not very appreciable, except in this view. He was uh, left untreated, and by the time he came to see me, at about three and a half to four weeks, you can see that he's already developing large cyst formation. And a CT shows you that he's grossly unstable with a large cyst. Now, this is a situation where, even though you see a large cyst, it does not appear that his scaphoid has flexed yet. And you can understand why, because look at the location of the fracture and the non-union. It is a B1 fracture well within the confines of the scaphalunate interosseous ligament, therefore suggesting that there is no humpback. So for me, this was an ideal indication to fix with a screw and graft from the distal radius, which you can see where I've harvested it from without having to resort to a tricortical or a trapezoidal graft with a predictable outcome. Our proximal poles. Traditional teaching, proximal pole non-unions, 
has evolved into considering vascularized bone grafts. Well, let's look at what contemporary data tells us. Here's someone who came to me four or six months out from football season with a very small proximal pole non-union. And again, you can see the fracture line is vertical. And he came with an MR, which shows that there was a degree of disvascularity on the proximal pole. Now, in most circumstances, the knee-jerk response would be, this needs a vascularized bone graft. So we decided to look at my own data over the course of about 14 years. And we wanted to see if, if you cal calculate the volume of the proximal pole fragment, does that tell you if it's going to heal or not? And does it dictate what happens to outcomes after you fixed it? And the idea was to fix it only with local graft plus screws. So we had 10 proximal poles. Uh, most of my patients were males and an average of about nine and a half months. You can see that some of them were done early, which were nascent non-unions. We used bone graft through the fracture site in seven and then one through the screw track. And for two proximal poles, I did not use a bone graft. But here's the interesting thing. We made sure we got them all imaged with a CT at 12 to 16 weeks. We just published this data this year. And what we found was, this is how we use the TerraRecon uh, software to calculate the proximal pole uh, volume and went on to predictable union. As long as you follow the principles of grafting and stable fixation with the CT at 14 weeks. So the proximal pole volume varied from seven to 21% and seven out of 10 healed within 16 weeks and three out of 10 had partial union at 16 weeks. So clearly it appeared that screw fixation and bone grafting works and the volume of the fracture fragment did not seem to correlate with ongoing non-union. Here's the smallest fragment we had, 7% of the entire scaphoid. And you can see from the proximal pole that there's hardly any bone to play with. I find it hard to understand how you would get a vascularized bone graft into this. So the idea was to simply graft it and fix it. This screw could have been a little bit shorter. It didn't need to be so long. And you can see in the post-op CT, has gone on to heal uneventfully. So the next question, which follows logically, is what, do you have a role for vascularized bone graft in scaphoid non-union? Again, like we said before, the scaphoid non-union with avascular necrosis, and I'm going to disavow you of using this term unless you have a pathological diagnosis. So why did we start putting vascularity into bones? Well, this concept is old, from, came from Hori in 1979 when he used a vascular bundle in the treatment of dysvascular situations around the corpus. Dr. Zeidenberg and his colleagues came up with a graph that we now use quite commonly uh, to repair scaphoid non-unions based off the 1-2 ICSRA. And this was popularized after this anatomic dissection from Patty Sheets and the uh, colleagues at Rochester uh, at the Mayo Clinic, who described in wonderful dissections the vascular anatomy of the distal radius. Now, you can see here that this is the 1-2 ICSRA. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the ICSRA, it is intercompartmental supraretinacular artery, a predictable set of vessels which are part of the vascularity of the distal radius between compartments one and two. So you can see it much better with these uh, tendons removed. You can see the one to ICSRA in a predictable fashion coming off the radial artery. And the one that I have used in the past more frequently is the two, three ICSRA between the second and third compartments sitting right on Lister's tubercle. The other vessels that you can avail of are the fourth extra compartmental artery and the fifth extra compartmental artery, which again, provide you bone plugs with vascularity attached to it. And on the volar side, there's a predictable vessel that you see, especially when you do the dissection the way that Anil showed you for exposing a distal radius fracture. There's always a predictable vessel which was popularized by Dr. Matulin uh, from France, which when you remove the radius, which is seen in the intermediate fibrous zone near the watershed line, and you take it with a bone plug from the intermediate column right in this vicinity. Okay, so here we have another proximal pole who was sent to me with a recommendation to have a vascularized bone graft and um, an MR, which looked like this. Now, once this, is, this does put you in an awkward spot because the recommendation has been made by someone else. So I decided to go do this with a vascularized graft. Now, is it necessary that I should have done it this way based on the data I just showed you? Probably not, but this is the incision that I would use. 
And if you have to go to a one, two, I would incline my incision in this manner. There's Lister's tubercle. The two, three ICSRA. Now, a key point to remember is when you exsanguinate these, do not use a tourniquet. You want to exsanguinate them just by elevation so you can identify your blood vessels. Now, here's Lister's tubercle. And there's your two, three ICSRA sitting on top. You harvest it with a bone plug, which is around. And this um, joins up with the branch of the posterior interosseous artery. And you have to cauterize that. And now you raise it based off the capsule which is here. You have to be very careful that you do not twist this because you could easily kill the vessels. Expose your non-union, prepare the non-union, and you drop the graft in. Now what you're going to notice is if your graft is going to occupy the dorsal portion, it is very critical that your screw be placed much more volar, especially since your fracture non-union was very vertical. And he went on to have a predictable union. The question you have to ask yourself is, would he have healed without doing a vascularized bone graft? Well, let's see what the data tells us. We had this paper from Scott Steinman, which showed us that the chances of union were 100%. And then the data goes all over the place where the non-union chances, where they thought the fragment was disvascular, goes from as low as 12% up to 100%. Joe Slade, uh, who is no longer with us, was a wonderful scaphoid surgeon, among other things, did this meta-analysis where they felt that if you used a vascularized bone graft, you had 88% chance of union without vascularized bone graft. Chance of union were only 47%. The problem with this, like any other meta-analysis, is what is your denominator? How do you define non-union? How do you define meta How do you define disvascularity? Like we said before, if you were going to call it avascular necrosis, then yes, you may make a level playing field, but is it truly a vascular necrosis? That's the reason I have remained reasonably unconvinced by that data. More importantly, when Scott Steinman's patients were followed for much longer, they found that the non-union rate dropped significantly because this is a follow-up study to the same set of patients for the few years down the line. And what they realized was older patients who had proximal pole disvascularity or who had humpbacks, and women smokers had a higher chance of, uh, of uh, failure of vascularized bone grafts. So furthermore, to add to the evidence that I showed you from my own data, you have the evidence here from Mark Cohen's group and Ricardo Lucchetti, who looked at two pro 20 proximal pole non-unions without fragmentation, and they simply fixed them with distal radius bone graft and uh, screws and they went on to have a 100% union rate, although two required redos. So if I had to give you a nugget of information, I would say, can you use vascularized bone graft? Yes, you can. Is there data to support its use? Of course there is. But do you need to have to use it in every proximal pole non-union or every time you get an MR where the proximal pole looks dark? Absolutely not. You have to be judicious and select them very carefully because there's emerging data to show that we really don't need to do it every time. Let's take this one step further. What about free tissue transfer? Because we are bandying this about medial femoral condyle, medial femoral trochlear must be used. Well, it was all popularized by this paper from Berger and Higgins, where they considered using a MFC reconstruction by excision of the proximal pole and replace it with the MFC and the question was, was it a long-term solution? And it was based off this uh, descending branch, uh, uh, descending genicular branch uh, coming off the femoral. But it's a big operation. You need to have microvascular expertise. You need to have two teams. And you need to have several hours of operating time. The question is, A, do you need it? And B, does it give you better outcomes? So let's look at the evidence. We looked at the paper that they published, 2013. They used it in 16 patients for proximal pole non-union with inadequate proximal pole fragment bone quality, not suitable for conventional reconstruction. To me, that is a very ambiguous definition. And they went on to say that 15 of 16 healed on CT, but they did not define non-union location. And 13 of 16 were approached volarly for proximal poles and five of 16 had no previous surgery. So the index operation was a free tissue transfer with no data on vascularity. 
that to me says a lot about the technique. So here's someone, 36 year old male. In my hands, this would be fixed with simple bone grafting and screws since the patient has not had any operation, but they fixed it with a vascularized free tissue transfer. Another paper by Buffet and colleagues, 15 cases, three scaphoid non-unions. In the text, it says four cases, table says three cases. So this data is all over the place. In no less than an August journal, like the Journal of Reconstructive Microsurgery, again, no data on vascularity. And look at the scaphoid that they fixed with a vascularized bone graft, with a free tissue transfer. This could have easily been fixed with the Fisk-Fernandez technique. This is a paper from Kumta and colleagues from the Indian Journal of Plastic Surgery. Again, in my hands, this would have been fixed with simple bone grafting and screw fixation. So you have to ask yourself about this. So here's a paper from Jones and Shin, 2010, foreshortening or humpback deformity and proximal fragment avascular necrosis. No definition of avascularity. Look at this. This to me is a simple fracture non-union with humpback and cyst formation could have been addressed with the fisk fernandez approach, but instead got this large free tissue transfer. You know from my data, as well as from Dr. Cohen's data, Lucchetti's data, that screw fixation and local bone grafting works, and that the volume of the fracture fragment does not seem to correlate with the risk of ongoing or post-operative non-union. Therefore, be very careful and be very, very judicious in thinking about free tissue transfer for addressing scaphoid non-unions. Finally, plating of scaphoid non-unions is being bandied about a lot. There is increasing data to show that it can be used, but is it a really new idea? It was first described in 1977, and in the last five years, there's been more than 10 papers talking about the virtues of plating a scaphoid non-union. Volar plating has been advocated more than dorsal plating. Finally, it appears that people are settling in on fixing scaphoid non-unions that have been operated before by plating them. The question is, do you have the resources? Do you have the expertise? And putting so much harder on the volar side of the scaphoid, what does it do to your range of motion? Therefore, I think it has a very limited role. So with those many thoughts bandied about, I'm going to leave you to think about all these things, come up with your own informed decisions, and don't necessarily follow anything that's published. Be judicious in what you use, interpret, and follow, and do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaitanya. Very clear concepts for the residents and also for the senior guys. I mean, it will help us in decision making. Uh, now we can go for the discussion stage. Uh, Dr. Fuad and Dr. Ayman from our team will discuss few cases with the panel. Dr. Anil, Nick, and Chaitanya take the opinion and help us regard, uh, regarding decision making in few complex cases. Fuad, you are okay? Hey, Shamsi. Hello. Shamsi, can you hear me? Yeah, Chaitanya. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, can I answer them online uh, on the air? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, it's fine. Yes, no problem. Uh, Basim Amin asked me, uh, what's my absolute indication for a vascularized bone graft? And I'm going to confuse the issue here. I have abandoned vascularized bone grafts in the last 10 years. I no longer do them. So the only indication for me would be if it has been operated before and if I feel that I can't address it by using non-vascularized bone graft and screw fixation. So that's number one. Fadi Buri asked me, uh, what do I think about using the Olacron for bone graft? It's been well described. I don't use it because I can always get it from the radius because it's exposed to the same incision. That's the reason I don't uh, use Olacron on. But is, has it been used? Absolutely. It's a totally viable option. But uh, you can also use uh, um, Mark Garcia Elias's technique where he harvests wonderful uh, bone graft, similar to what Jeffrey Fisk did, just from the distal radius. I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, shall we go on for the discussion stage? Please. Sorry, yeah, I took more time. No, no, it's okay. It's fine. Uh, Shamsi, I think Nick is asking for his video to be... On. Yeah, Isam, I told Isam to start with some... Yeah, Shamsi, you got the video? 
Yeah, for Nick. To, can you add Nick to the? Ah, uh, uh, he's out. Okay, okay. Hey, Sam, I'm I'm oh. unmuted myself. But when I when I click to start video, it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Um, let me see. Ya. Mm. Okay. You got it, doctor. Yeah, okay. doctor. Chet Chetanya also has to be around for the easy around. Fuad, are we there? ready? Fuad? Let give me a second. <clears throat> Fuad. I had to get a refill on my coffee. Share screen Share screen Share screen Share screen Yeah, yeah. There's one question for you, Chaitanya. Yeah. No, no, on the chat. Okay. How uh, long it takes for the disvascularized bone to revascularize after fixation and grafting? Um, I have, uh, I honestly don't know, but I think if you look at uh, disvascularity of the proximal portion of the scaphoid after a vase fracture, uh, if Mark Cohen's data suggested that in about six months, um, provided the fracture goes on to uneventful union, the proximal portion will be revascularized. That's number one. Number two, because I've stopped getting MRs on all my scaphoid non-unions, uh, I honestly don't know if they're disvascular. And on another level, I, I'm not entirely certain I care much longer because um, I just think that you, you have a combination of biology and stability, uh, it's going to heal. Uh, the question being, you have to give it stability in addition to biology. I completely agree. It doesn't. It doesn't matter if it revascularizes. You want it to unite. And yes. how long it takes to do that is, is of no significance. Yeah. Um, it, it's a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Yeah. I, I think to make it, I think hand surgeons massively overcomplicate scapegoat non-union. If we put <laughs> a picture, and I, and I don't think you did, if we put on a picture of a bent, ununited tibia. Everybody would know, I need to straighten it, I need to fix it, I need to optimize its biology, and I need to exclude infection. Now, infection in scaphoid non-union exists, but it's increasingly yeah. rare. And if yeah. you do those three things, yeah. you'll get it to heal. And yes. Everybody, the thing that most people don't take into account is correcting the anatomy. You can yeah. do a beautiful bone wrap, you can put whatever you want in there. If you don't yeah. fix it and restore the anatomy, it won't work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Shamsi, shall I proceed? Uh, shall I proceed? Am I okay? audible? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can proceed. Yeah, so yeah. we have, uh, I mean, we have gone about, so we have short of time. We'll go we'll most probably four or, we maximum move, four uh, or five cases. Just, yeah. One or two cases, and uh, I'll present one case, and then Dr. Ayman will. Yeah, we'll go on fast. Yeah, okay. all of this is a weekend, uh, weekend lunch break. Okay, 38 year old uh, gentleman, motor vehicle collision, bilateral wrist injury with multiple other injuries. And this is the of uh, the left side, which shows uh, a perilunate dislocation. And uh, all, are all the panels there, like Dr. Nick, Dr. Anil, and Mm -hmm. I would like to ask Dr. Nick regarding the x-ray. Uh, how would you expect a candidate to be explaining or describing the x-ray? You're muted, Nick. The first thing I'd say is I expect him to spot it. And I think if you've spotted the fact that this is a play we make, half of the battle is won. Um, if looking at this image, 
it looks as though the scaphoid is fractured. You know, there may well be a fracture to the lunate as well. You know, but if they've picked up the fact that this is a perilunate injury, it's a high energy injury, they need to exclude other concomitant injuries and assess the patient from an ATLS perspective. You, your battle is already partly won. Okay, okay. so uh, basically you need to look at the glulose lines. You need to look at the shape of the lunate, whether is it in the lunate fossa. You need to look at the capitate, whether it is um, dorsally or volarly displaced and uh, so uh, we did a CT which shows a uh, transcaphoid, transstyloid, perilunate with a lunate fracture, volar lunate fracture and there is also a uh, tracheotrum evulsion of the tracheotrum. So if you want to check at the C, uh, CT, 3D CT, Oh. Well, Fua, there are there are mul multiple arcs. Uh, it's not that uh, classically it's always, you know, it goes around the lunate. It can go through the lunate. There are translunate injuries. There are infralunate injuries also. So when you have a fracture of the lunate also, along with the perilunate kind of a disruption. So you need to yes. think of different kind of mechanism happening here. It's not the classical Mayfield kind of a progression which happens. So you have here, there is a translunate kind of an injury. And sometimes it just doesn't involve anything. It goes through the style bed and it goes in, in below the lunate also, infralunate kind of injury also. So there are different arcs, greater, lesser, plus translunate, plus infralunate also. Okay. So um, like uh, once we get a, such an X-ray, what is the next question that the candidate should be expecting? or should we wait for that question and he goes and explains the clinical examination findings. What are the clinical examination that he should be addressing? Uh, Dr. Nick, I'd can you? I'd be expecting the patient to be examining the patient holistically, excluding other injuries, carefully documenting the status of the median nerve. And then if they've got this CT scan, I think it's unlikely that you'll be able to reduce that to a better position closed and i'd be talking about i would so the statement the the line that i think is really well used in the frcs is to say i would refer this to my local specialty uh, hand surgery service you have to say that because you, you have to explain that you're not going to take this on yourself but if you stop there the examiners must get sick and tired of asking people what is the hand surgeon going to do so the sentence is, I would uh, refer this to my local hand surgery service, but their principles of management would be. And then you know the question is going to come. So just take it out of the equation and explain to them what they would be. So for this, you know, once you've excluded the fact that, it, once you've protected the median nerve, you're reducing the lunate, you're holding it reduced, you're reconstructing the injured structures, and you're protecting them and allowing the patient to rehabilitate at a sensible time point. If you're asking me what I would do, I would do a Palmer approach. I'd uh, release and protect the median nerve. Um, I would fix the lunate with a headless compression screw. I'd fix the scaphoid from the back with a headless compression screw. And I'd then reconstruct the Palmer ligaments and whatever ligaments are injured at the back. I suspect the scaphoid ligament has been injured. Um, it's, it's one of the common misconceptions I put in the, in the chat box. People say that you can't get a scaphoid fracture and the scaphoid lunate ligament injury. That's just wrong. Um, so I'd re then reconstruct the ligaments, put them into cast for eight weeks with buried K wires to protect the ligaments and then go from there. Yeah, uh, that's what uh, we did. And uh, this is how we uh, dealt with that case. Uh, first we did a uh, Polar approach with a headless screw, we fixed the lunate, stabilized the lunate to the radius, and then the wrist came into position. Then we did a fixation of the scaphoid, repair of the scaphoid-lunate ligament, which was destructive, as well as an anchor for the trichotrum repairing the lunotracheotral ligament. The scaphoid was fixed with a K wire, and then it uh, stable. The patient also had a fracture of the proximal 
radial shaft, which was fixed in the same setting. And uh, this is the final X-ray. I think the only thing I would have done differently is instead of using a radial styloid K wire, I'd have swapped that for a headless compression screw, and that's it. Okay. The piece was too small biggest. So, and that's why we went in with a K wire. Any other modifications or any other improvements that could have been made here or? No, this is, this, yeah, this is a bad injury. And I would have, I would have consented the patient for a PRC. I would have said to him, if I go in there and this is completely smashed more than it appears, you know, I'm not, this isn't my first line of treatment, but it may be that I need to do a proximal rocarpectomy for you. Do you have any different pattern of wiring? Um, so I would have protected the radial lunate ligament. Uh, sorry, I would have protected the lunotriquetral ligament with a triquetral lunate wire and then a triquetral capitate wire. Um, but I think, you know, that's not an improvement. That's just a different way of doing it. Regarding the, uh, after the repair of the trichotro ligament, do you routinely do a capsulodesis while closing the capsule? No, I, I think you end up doing a capsulodesis as part of your closure. You know, it, it's impossible to oppose it perfectly and it ends up being a bit tighter. And I think a capsulodesis is not a bad thing. Um, you know, you're, you're supporting the carpus more. So I wouldn't lose too much sleep. I, you know, these are, these are bad injuries. And if they're getting three quarters range and three quarters grip, they're doing well. What will be the time duration for these K-wires? When you said you will uh, hold the reduction with a K-wire or secure the fixation with a K-wire, what was the ideal time for removal of the K-wires? There's no evidence to say when the best time is because they're ligaments, I leave mine in for uh, eight weeks and because they're in joints, I bury them. But that, you know, I think, I don't think it matters whether you leave them out or in, but just because they're in joint, I feel a bit more secure by closing the skin over the top. Okay. Uh, after we remove the k wires, what is the way to assess the healing? That is it only clinical, or we do want to go any other further radiological imaging to assess the proper healing of the ligaments that we have reconstructed? No, I don't assess healing of the ligaments. I'd probably get him a CT scan before I took his wires out to make sure his scaphoid and his lunate had healed so that I could say to him, You know, we know the scaphoid's united, wires out, you just go for it. Because at some point you're going to have to mobilize him because you can't just keep him in cast forever and ever and ever. So um, it's nice to have that data to say there's nothing to contradict you from absolutely going for it on your physio. Okay. And uh, depending upon the improvement or the progression of the physio, is that you decide unrestricted activity of that limb? Is it? Well, if you've got a CT scan, if you've got a CT scan that shows his lunate and his scaphoids healed, just go okay. for it. Will a, will a stress fuse of the wrist uh, do anything good instead of a CT scan? Uh, so stress fuse at this point, I don't think are helpful. We're, we're in a position where at eight weeks, he needs to get going or else he's just going to be stiff forever. I think having a CT scan to document his union is useful. His ligaments are going to gap a bit, and he is, you know, he is going to get a little bit of escape of lunate diastasis. But you need to return him back to some kind of normality, and I wouldn't stress too much about the ligamentous repairs here. I'd just start to get him moving and see what function he gets back. Yeah. And uh, regarding the recovery of function, um, I heard in your talk that you said grip strength and the range of motion is the maximum that we can expect is seventy-five percent. No, I didn't say that was the maximum. I said, I said if they are getting... So the way of thinking about this is that this is a bad injury. So you have to set expectations early. So yeah. When I see the patient for the first time, I say, this is a really bad injury to your wrist. I can't return with a more perfect wrist. This is what the evidence says. 
the evidence says you'll get about three quarters range of motion and three quarters grip strength. If you get more than that, I'm happy. Okay. So uh, one question to Dr. Anil. Anil, sir. Yeah. Does sure. this uh, does this injury, the translunate ones, does it perform worse or is it better compared to the normal Mayfield types? Uh, the translunate ones, I think, uh, there's uh, probably a report of seven or eight cases. We have reported one recently. And uh, basically, it, it dep it's usually the ulnar lip, the palmar lip, which gets fractured. And depends on how big the fragment is uh, for you to fix it nicely. In this, you've, you've done a good job of fixing it nicely so that the whole thing is uh, seated nicely in you know, the captive lunate uh, articulation. Also very important to repair the capsule and uh, in the ulnar side uh, uh, once you do the fixation. That's again very important so that there's no uh, instability on the ulnar side later on. So that's the second point. The third point is the, the, sub, the chondral damage itself in these injuries. So a lot of times stiffness is proportionate to, of course, there's a bad injury. There are ligament injuries and, you know, we've done the repair and, you know, sometimes do ulnar dorsal repairs, all those things. So there is a surgical trauma, there is uh, ligament injuries also. Apart from that, uh, what you need to document during your surgery is the amount of chondral damage. Especially you see that in a classic perilunate, you see it in, on the capitate uh, when it's you know, kind of shearing off. So those things have to be documented. Those are the patients which actually uh, uh, might have more stiffness than the routine perilunate ones. So when you mobilize, you have to think about that also as to, you know, which ones do uh, better and which ones do worse. And you need to counsel the patient if you have noticed and documented these chondral damages. And they might actually end up with uh, more uh, stiffness of uh, early degenerative arthritis. So those are the three points you need to think about. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll stop there. I had prepared a lot of cases, but uh, time doesn't allow. Dr. Ayman will take over now. Uh, Assam. Thank you so much, Dr. Nick, Dr. Nick and Dr. Anik. Thanks, Fuad. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fuad. Uh, Dr. Raymond can share right away. Uh, Assalamu <laughs> alaikum everybody. Uh, I have a lot of cases, so I will run quickly with every case. This just show what are we doing in our department. And I think if any comment will be at the end of my talk. Uh, this 13 years old boy, highly competitive, playing golf. And he had a history of falling down one year before coming to my clinic. And this was his x-ray which shows uh, a lot of sclerosis of the scaphoid and uh, a cystic formation in the middle. But this was his CT scan. It's a big cyst occupying most of the proximal and distal pole and uh, a small non-union of the proximal pole. Uh, I usually do non-vascularized bone graft for any case of non-union of scaphoid. I don't have experience with the vascularized bone graft, except the pronator quadratus bone graft. Uh, and this is the transverse cut. Also show most of the scaphoid has been occupied by a big cyst. And this is MRI, we'll, we'll not talk about it because of short of time. But this is what we have done. This uh, scaphoid non-union, it takes around five months to heal. 
And this is the final because the proximal pole has healed already. And, and this is the plain X ray during last follow up, which was one year. I'll show another case. This is an adult who came complaining of wrist pain and about six months after having an injury. Plain X-ray showed non-united proximal pole as well. And this is his CT scan. No much hump, but small proximal pole. I used to use an iliac bone graft for most of my cases, but for such a case, I used radial bone graft. Radial bone graft. Radial using bone graft. A tree. I used it refined to get one, two, and three pieces. And this to show where the graft has been inserted. This CT done just to confirm healing. This is regarding the how we are dealing with the non-union of scaphoid. Okay. This, as can you see, is a trans scaphoid. Transcapitate dorsal perilunate fracture dislocation of left wrist. And this CT scan to show that the scaphoid is displaced and the proximal pole of the capitate or head of capitate is commuted. We approach it as usual through posterior approach, which is Mayo approach, which can show you most of the carpal bones from dorsally and taking care to leave part of the dorsal intercarpal ligament and dorsal radiocarpal ligament for repair later and for function. And this is what we have done. We fix this scaphoid with screw and capitate. We put two K wires since the proximal fragment is very small. Usually in such cases, fix the capitate first, which facilitates if still the scaphoid is fractured, you can still manipulate and do some traction to reduce such a small fracture. We also repair this, the lunar tracheotomy ligament and fix it to the K wire. This is during follow up. And this is five months after the injury. Another case of leonid dislocation, trans scaphoid. Patient has a uh, median nerve compression symptoms as soon as he uh, arrived to emergency and he was taken directly to theater. Median nerve was decompressed and the bone fragments of the 
scaphoid and the lunate were reduced during the or between the rent of the capsule. That that trichetium made junction was opened, so we have to fix it with two K wires. The scaphoid unit ligament also was repaired and stabilized with another two K wires. And this is the final. The scaphoid unit ligament was re disrupted and the scaphoid is almost healed. And this is the range of motion patient has a good extension, but his flexion was limited. This is a right-handed teacher, 34 years old, came complaining of pain and stiffness of left wrist. He had a history of fall down five years before coming to our clinic. Uh, his PA X-ray showed that the carpal bones has been disrupted somehow, and we cannot see the lunate and tri trichetium well, but other views showed that this was a uh, dorsal perilunate dislocation of the wrist. Patient was consulted for doing either proximal rocker pake to me or wrist arthrodesis since he is still young. And we told him that it may depend on the findings during surgery to see the arthrosis of the radiocarpal joints, but he preferred not to go for arthrodesis and just to go for proximal rocker pake to me, which was done. But during the first follow-up, patient having some pain which remains and increases and became intolerable. And at one year, pain was very much and he cannot tolerate it. And he agreed to go for arthrodesis. And this is the final X-ray after consolidation of that arthrodesis. Uh, we have other cases, but if we have a lot of discussions, we can stop at this time. Dr. Shamsi? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ayman. Um, I would ask the panel if they have um, any comments or questions. So, uh, Shamsi, can I make a couple points? Uh, yes, of course. Oh, go ahead. Um, you know, when you have small articular fragments, if you have the availability, you should use uh, threaded K wires. They're fully threaded. And if you have a nice tip cutting wire cutter, you insert them once and you just cut it flush with the articular surface and they behave wonderfully like small headless screws because you don't have to replace them. You can put multiple ones and that works wonderfully for small articular fragments. So that's number one. And number two is uh, for all my PRCs, I do a dorsal capsulotomy, which is shaped like a C. It's based proximally and goes distally all the way to the base of the third metacarpal. And I elevate it and I keep it there. And if I don't like the articular cartilage and the capitate, I drop it in as an interposition arthroplasty. And uh, we just finished looking at my data over the last several years. And uh, so far, I've had to revise only one out of 15 to an arthrodesis. So it's a good technique to think of. I don't know how useful it will be in your environment, but it's a good technique to uh, think of. Yeah. yeah. But how long it may last if you do this uh, interposition arthroplasty? We don't know that. And uh, what I, from my personal data, I know that I, my oldest one is probably about 16 years, I think which yeah. is not unreasonable. Um, yes. the, one, the one that I revised was uh, 
I think uh, I, I don't know that I did a good enough justice to the flap. So the flap has to really go distal on the metacarpal base. Only then will it sit down and you can sew it to the volar radiocarpal ligaments and it works very nicely as an interposition. But like I said, I, the longest follow-up I have is probably about 15 or 16 years, I think. That's good. If it lasts for 15 years, it's nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Any more comments, please? It's, it's nice to see that you also don't use vascularized bone grafts. Uh, yes, unfortunately, I'm uh, old enough. I cannot use a, a, a loop or a um, scoop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I do. You do, but are you old enough? <laughs> <laughs> I'm over 60, that's why. So Chaitanya, I had one question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we've been using the same Cohen's technique of screw first and graft next kind of a technique, and uh, we've also used it uh, to the, the all all levels of fracture non-unions. Mm -hmm. it, it's distal, based, or proximal. Uh, so all the three uh, uh, levels, uh, it has, it can be used, and we've used a distal radius graft throughout uh, always. Yeah. So yes. so. Does it does it really matter in terms of very proximal poles? You you showed me that uh, you showed the series where it, it, the volume of the proximal pole doesn't matter. Hmm. But when we use this kind of a technique, uh, does it matter or is it still the same? So for small proximal poles, whenever I approach them dorsally, I either graft. So it when you open it up, you're going to see whether the cartilage cap is intact or not. Correct. If the cartilage cap is intact then I will fix it with a screw. But before I put the screw in, I graft through the screw site. Okay. But you have to be careful that your drill doesn't go past the distal pole because you, you don't want a graft falling out the other end. So okay. you drill, drill within the confines of the scaphoid. And as you push the graft in and you put the screw in, the, I think the, screw, the graft tends to follow the path of least resistance and goes into the non-union. It's an old Joe Slate technique. And I, it seems to work. If the cartilage cap is broken, I levered the non-union open, curate it, graft it under vision, and then fix it with the screw. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the way I do proximal poles. So uh, we do the reverse where we use the screw as a strut and then pack the graft all around the screw and then come up all early and then completely pack it at the end. So even for proximal whenever the post, poles? Whenever the posterior cortex is intact, yes. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that's good for distal poles or for uh, wastes. Waste, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sir. Where is the stop sharing? Sir, yes, I would like yeah. to discuss one distal radius short one with Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Chaitanya Mukherjee, and you can show yeah. Go ahead. Uh, this is a X-ray of a 28-year-old male, manual labor, history of fall, and right-hand dominant. Uh, this is the post-reduction X-ray. So uh, I would like to get your opinion regarding, first of all, how do you read this X-ray with regard to the fixation techniques? Is it, uh, Dr. Chaitanya, can you enlighten us? So a couple of things to think about here. Uh, one is that the, it's a, it largely involves the radial column and the intermediate column. And my concern is that the intermediate column is split and uh, there is very likely articular depression uh, right about here. I don't know if I'm showing it, but so if possible, I'd get a CT and I would get a 3D reconstruction with the corpus subtracted. If not possible, so they, you got depression, much like we suspected, and the intermediate column is split. So that's a very predictable pattern, uh, which uh, Charlie Malone showed us nearly 30 years ago. Um, and so there you go. So are you able to subtract the corpus? If not, that's fine. No. 
So in my hands, uh, I would see if I can address this with a volar locking monoblock plate, but I'm not worried if I can't. Uh, I would just fix the intermediate column first with a fragment specific uh, plate and then assemble the radial column to it. Um, I would then assess the integrity of the corpus by fluoroscoping the radiocarpal uh, and the intercarpal ligaments and uh, see whether the corpus sits in the cup of the distal radius on the lateral view. If it does reasonably satisfactorily, I don't need to do anything dorsally, but if I need to, I'll open it dorsally. If I can address it all with a monoblock, I'd do that, but I'd be very mindful of keeping the uh, plate proximal to the watershed line uh, satisfactorily. So, so uh, you said, uh, now this is the this problem is, of the uh, dorsal interesting polarity. So, this is the technique that you use so that uh, you get hold of the dorsal fragments or you have any other special techniques to discuss. So if you have, you know, um, so the question is the dorsal fragment and its location. If the dorsal fragment is in the, in the radial two thirds, I don't worry about it too much if it is less than one, uh, 25%. If it involves the sigmoid notch and if it's less than 25%, I still don't worry about it. But if it involves the sigmoid notch and is more than 25 to 30% or more, then I will make sure that I include it with my volar fixation. If I'm not happy with my volar fixation, I will. I have no hesitation in opening it dorsally, and I usually fix it with threaded key wires or with a cannulated screw with the head, and I use a washer so it acts like a one-hole plate to get that fragment down. Uh, I, otherwise, I, I rarely, if ever, need to go dorsally because I usually leave my volar pegs about four millimeters short of the dorsal surface anyway. Okay. So uh, you don't have to cast the cortex. The, do you need to have a double cortex purchase in these no. kind of fixed? No, absolutely not. This, this construct is based on the concept of fixed angle subchondral support, which Matthew Putnam gave us almost 30 years ago. And the idea of subchondral support is you just tip the, scaphor, the, tip the articular surface into its uh, anatomic inclination by being subchondral. And when I say subchondral means you have to be within two to three millimeters of the chondral surface. So if not, it can still settle on your pegs. But the key is if you look at the data from Lindley Wall and colleagues from Wash U, they showed that this fixed angle construct functions just as good if you're four millimeters short and you test it in the lab and you give it angular strain, it will not fail as long as it's not too short. So you don't need bicortical purchase, but less than up to four millimeters short of the dorsal articular surface is more than adequate. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, do you do bone grafting? What people get concerned about is not sorry. The the what I would say is is that useful things to remember is is that you can still use dorsal K wise here as temporary mm -hmm. reduction. Absolutely. Tool. So I'll often Absolutely. do a dorsal Capanji technique to reduce this fragment before fixing it through the plate. Um, and I, I, I rarely bone graft, which I think was the next question. Yes, yes, rarely bone graft. So uh, to sum up, what is your absolute indication for a dorsal plating? Uh, for me, dorsal plating I'll do if I cannot uh, safely get control from the volar approach. And if it's a multi-fragmentary fracture, then I'll use a dorsal plate. If it's a radiocarpal fracture dislocation, I may use a dorsal plate. Uh, and if it's a scaphoid impression fracture, uh, which is a very unique entity, uh, then I'll use a dorsal plate. Okay. okay. Nick, Nick, do you use a dorsal plate often? Um, I wouldn't say often, but I don't, I'm not concerned about using it. I think it's particularly useful to dorsal shear fractures. To me, it kind of makes more sense to approach those um, through the back. You know, if you've got a really small palmar rim fragment, but a decent chunk to play with on the back, then um, I'll, I'll approach those from the back. Um, I think fragments specific plates are excellent options, but as get outs, if you, you know, you, 
I think the key thing from Anil's presentation was to plan these fractures properly and to not underestimate them. But if you find yourself, you know, in trouble, um, Simon, uh, Simon Dennison from Mayo published on using K wires and then bending them on the palm of surface of the radius and then putting a plate over the top. It's a useful get out for palmer ring fragments if you don't have a plate. And for the lunate for set, um, I've used um, hand plates. So I've used uh, two millimeter hand plates if there's nothing else available. So just think laterally. Um, the other thing is, is that if you can't find a distal radius plate to fit, you've not got one in, have a look at the foot and ankle sets because they've often got some nice fixation kit you can use. Uh, getting a bit itchy but i'd like to say thank you very much for the invitation and uh it's been an absolute pleasure thanks nick okay. uh you I'm sorry oh, i had to disturb yeah. you during your vacation no, no, no it was fun thank you very much yeah oh, okay so for those people you oh, know for you those of us using the vola plate for a dorsal fixation we would try to get the screws as just close to the cortex as possible. And this one view of X-ray is one which we should not miss. Dr. Uh, Dr. Anil has referred to it uh, betterly. And this is the axial view which you should be using more frequently. And uh, when we ask a peroperative true lateral view, we fight with the radiologist, why don't we give a true lateral view? And what makes a true lateral view? There's uh, two things which I would find as the, the, the bisector of the lunate passes through the volar shaft this is if this goes in line and the distal tip of the scaphoid goes overlaps the pisciform and uh, this forms a true lateral view you can you need not look all the other things to find it so thank you panelists uh, this is my presentation and uh, this is how we went about it uh, we did a volar plate and we elevated the dorsal fragment through a uh, in the articular mm -hmm. fragment and through a mini uh, small incision in the dorsal aspect, and then we got finally the, the result. We did bone graft as well. Thank so, uh, you. Hey, Shamsi. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to have to be a little rude and I have to leave. I have another comment. No, no, it's fine. It's almost we are late. Even I was about to sort of wind up actually. Yeah. So it's, we are almost half an hour. We are by almost half an hour so thank you all of you it's a weekend i'm sure all of you have something planned up uh nick has already left his you know resort somewhere in uk so his connection was not that great thank you dr anil thank you dr Chet dr chaitanya and of course dr Ayman from our side uh it was a very good discussion for all our residents there were almost 100 participants i'm sure it has benefited all of us so i think we can have something like this in the future again thank you anil for organizing thank it thank you Thanks, Shamsi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chetanya. Thank you, all of you. Take care. Thanks, all. Bye now. Bye. Bye, Chetanya. Bye, Anil. Thank you very much. Bye, Dr. El Bye. Bye.